Hello, my name is Dr. Ang Harrod Redkin and I'm a clinical psychologist who works with children and families and it is a real pleasure to be talking to you today about child development as part of our What About Aruna series. This series was designed to help us really understand what it means to put children first when it comes to separation and divorce. So this very first session we'll look at child development and does the age of your child influence how they experience your separation or divorce? I hope to be able to answer that question over the next 20 to 30 minutes by using loads of research findings. There's so much scientific evidence out there that helps us to understand what children are going through and how they see the world. So I'm hoping to share some of that with you today so that we can think about what do children think and feel and do at different ages, but also what does this mean? for them going through separation and divorce. You may think, well, why is it important to think about child development? Well, it is so important because children grow so, so quickly. I don't need to tell you that. You've probably seen it yourself. But while we can understand some of the physical changes that happen, so for example, we're used to the red book, aren't we, where they chart the growth of your baby. We're used to health visitors telling us about the importance of tummy time and then being able to sit upright. We're used to seeing them ride a bike or tie their shoelaces and think about that as a big physical development. But what about all the other stuff that's going on for our children at the same time? Their psychological development, their emotional development, their social development. This is much less talked about and this is what I want to think about with you today. So just to give you an example, when your child learns to walk, it's not just about the muscles and their legs and backs getting strong enough for them to walk. There are so many other things that happen as a result of that. So when your child learns to walk for the first time in their life, they are able to go where they want to go, not where someone has put them and placed them. So that means they can go and follow their curiosity. So they may go and put their hands in the fire or go and reach out for their hot pan on the stove. And suddenly you say, no, don't do that. I've told you before, don't do that. And then when your child looks at you and sees that cross face, they can feel this hot flush of shame and having to learn how to deal with that. And then you as mum or dad would say to them, oh, listen, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I just don't want you to hurt yourself. And I told you before not to go and do that. So just learning to walk is not about just physical development. It's about learning to cope with lots of different emotions and learning how to deal with shame and being in the wrong. And for you as a parent, your relationship with your child changes because suddenly you're having to say no all the time. So this is why it's so important to think about child development, especially when we're putting it in the context of a separation or a divorce where you as a parent already got three million things to think about, let alone what your child needs from you at that very point. So that's why it's important to think about child development. So I'm going to break it up into some age brackets for you. So the very first age group, the zero to two year olds. Well, what do we know about these little, little, little creatures? Well, the very first and most important thing I need to tell you is not just about nappies and milk. And I say this because there's so many people that I speak to who they've got little babies and they're saying, well, they're just little. They don't speak. They don't really understand things. All they need is the nappies changed and to be fed. No, there's so much more that they need from you at this point. This stage is crucial. If you think of childhood as like building a house, these are the foundations. And if we don't get these foundations right, then our house might be at risk of wobbling forevermore. So it's not just about nappies and milk, because in this age period, they're starting to think about themselves. They're beginning to understand others, social awareness, emotional recognition. There's all sorts of things that are happening at this age. But traditionally, what we might think about is, yes, they can start walking. So they move from not being able to do anything to being able to walk within this 18 month period. And as we've seen, being able to walk comes with all sorts of other issues as well. But what they also do is they can start to talk. And we know how important talking is as a way of expressing ourselves and our needs. So around the ages of sort of 12 to 18 months, babies and toddlers can start to speak and say words and start to express their needs but what we've got to remember is in order to produce language they must have heard it so talking to your baby from the literally from the moment they're born is crucial because the more words they hear the easier it is going to be for them to produce their own words so talking to your baby communicating with them is absolutely essential for them to then be able to start talking to you 
and the dastardly process of toileting. Um, we know that sort of from 18 months now, um, babies are toilet trained, um, can happen to anything up to two or three years, and we know it's getting later and later. And isn't this interesting? Because maybe one, if not two generations ago, parents were toilet training their babies 12 to 18 months old because they didn't have enough nappies to go for the, around to the next baby. So we can see how cultural changes and differences impact on child development as well. So zero to two, there's a lot going on. I want to talk to you very briefly about attachment theory. And I want you to have a stop for a moment and think to yourself, have you heard about attachment theory? If so, do you know what it means? Do you understand it? It's a very interesting, brilliant, complicated theory. Um, so I'm only going to do the tiniest surface level description of it. But if you want to find out more, go for it, because it is very interesting. But attachment theory is basically an idea that we are born with a biological urge or a biological drive to attach to a caregiver. And that is to keep us safe and to help us to survive. It makes sense, doesn't it? You're a tiny helpless baby. You need to attach, you want to really closely attach to somebody so that they can look after you. But what has been found over time and hypothesized about is that that first attachment relationship to your primary caregiver sets a sort of blueprint, like an instruction manual all relationships thereafter. So do you remember a moment ago I said that zero to two age group is so important because it sets the foundations. Well, a big part of those foundations is the attachment relationship because a baby's understanding of themselves, the world and others is influenced forevermore by that first or those first few attachment relationships. So really important stuff, isn't it? And depending on your child's attachment quality or style or relationship or type, there's many different terms for it, they will manage uncertainty differently. So we can all look the same. When life is going on nicely, we can all kind of look similar, can't we, in terms of how we behave or think or feel. But when a crisis happens, suddenly our attachment behaviours kick in. And the way we deal with that crisis is determined and dictated, it is thought, by that initial attachment relationship. So how your child experiences your separation, the uncertainty that comes with it, the changes that come with it, will be influenced by their attachment style. And this attachment style is believed to be in place by roughly three years of age. So we've literally only got those first three years to set up a blueprint for our children of how they are gonna understand themselves the world and others. Pretty important stuff, isn't it? So it is a theory and there is an awful lot of evidence to sort of back it up, but it's still just a theory. But it's a really helpful one to help us to understand that that zero to two years age group is so important. So what does it mean for how they would experience a divorce? Let's say you're going through a separation now and you've got a one year old. Let's say it would be so easy to think, well, they're so young, they don't understand. It doesn't matter. It won't impact on them. It will, and I don't mean that in a scary way, but in a like, let's really think about what they need here way. So even though they may not seem to be aware of things, they sense an awful lot. These little babies are like little sponges. They will absorb everything and they will sense things. So they will sense the conflict around them, even if they don't really have the words to understand it at that point. Also, what I thought was really interesting is that there's lots of research looking at adults who experienced a divorce when they were young and they ask adults, how are you now? You know, these are people in their 40s. How are, how are you now, given that you experienced a divorce when you were younger? What is really interesting is that, well, we know that experiencing a divorce when you're a child impacts you as an adult, but for men, the zero to four age group was the only age group that significantly impacted on their well-being as an adult. And this was in one study. So even as a 40 something year old man, the fact that you experienced your, parent, your parents separating or divorcing before the age of four still had a major impact on you as an adult. So this is just one study, but it's one study that reminds us this is a really important age group. It is really important to get it right for our zero to two year olds. 
Um, so even though they may not seem to notice or understand, they it is a very sensitive period of development. So they need a lot of thinking about and caring for. So that is very important for our zero to two year olds. Now, what about three to five year olds, our wonderful toddlers, our bossy, independent, talkative, moving toddlers? Well, it's a lovely stage of development. It's a very challenging stage of development for parents because your relationship changes with your child. Suddenly you're having to tell them what to do and not to do and cope with their bossiness. But what the wonderful thing about this age also is it's the golden age of play. Can I tell you now, play is not a frivolous waste of time. Yes, I know it's boring sometimes as an adult to have to play that same game again. But play is the absolute building block of child development. So it's like going to work for kids. You know, if we had a really nice job, I have a really nice job. It's the place where I learn to feel good about myself. I achieve, I succeed. I learn to negotiate and compromise and tolerate all of these things. This is what play is for our children between ages of three to five. It is a, such an important part of their development. So they learn about themselves. They learn about others. Um... And what is really important about this age group as well is that rather than just feel, they can start talking about feelings. They can start developing all sorts of ways of letting you know this is how I'm feeling. This is what I'm going to do about how I'm feeling. So they're developing all sorts of wonderful ways of coping with their own emotions. There's a very important developmental shift in this age group as well, which you may have heard of. And it's called the theory of mind. So the theory of mind is your ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes so it's a bit like empathy, but it's more. It's more to do with understanding how someone is thinking and that actually they can have a different um, view to you. They can have a different thought to you. And this happens somewhere, well, it's believed to happen somewhere between the ages of four to five years of age, where they begin to understand other people's thoughts and feelings. This doesn't mean that suddenly they'll do everything um, wonderfully because they understand what people are thinking, but it means they've got a slightly more insight into other people which is a really important skill when you think about playing and when you think about being at home with siblings or being at home with mum or dad, that actually being able to understand other people's feelings makes things make a little bit more sense. So if you've got a three to five year old, how are they experiencing divorce? Well, they are understanding a lot, but not everything. Because they're starting to talk and use words and chat away, it can be very easy for us as adults to overestimate their understanding. Oh, they use big, long words and they seem to understand everything. No, they don't. They really, really, really don't. It's being able to talk about things, which is important, but you need to check in with them. What do you understand about that? Oh, right. OK, so what do you mean about that? Don't just assume they understand everything. Behaviour changes. So at this age, children who are going through a separation divorce can just seem to be getting on with it. Oh, they're fine. No, they're absolutely fine. Yeah, they don't, don't seem that upset at all. Actually, they are going to be showing their upsetness, their confusion, their anger, their frustration in different ways and usually through their behaviour. So you may well see regression, which means going back to more babyish type things. They might want a bottle again. They might want to come and sleep in bed with you again. Um, they might be um, to start talking in kind of baby voices again. They might be non-compliant. So suddenly they're starting to say, uh, no, I'm not going to do that a bit more than they were before because they're wanting to dig their heels in and show you who's boss. I really don't like the word attention seeking, but they may be more attention seeking. They be, may be needing your attention more to help soothe and comfort themselves. And kids will get attention in whichever way they can. They may ask politely for it. Mum, Dad, please can I have your attention? But chances are they're going to shout, scream, throw things about, uh, be really annoying in order to get your attention. So keep an eye out for that attention seeking. I'd like to call it attention needing behaviour, um, but also controlling behaviour. So we know that being three, four, five years old is a time where Normally, you'd be feeling anxious about things. You might be feeling anxious about the dark or about monsters or this is a time where loads of nightmares start kicking in. You might be worried about separation, abandonment. How am I going to cope with that dad or mum there? There's a lot of worries anyway, being a three, four, five year old. Stick in a parental separation where everything that you've known so far is being turned on his head. Then these children are going to be feeling more anxious. When we get anxious, what do we do? We become more controlling. 
in order to try and reduce our anxiety. So let's say I am anxious about flying on an aeroplane. I don't like flying, let's say, so before my holiday, where I'm starting to get more and more anxious about getting on that plane, I will try to control things. I will control my packing. I will do lists. I will have all sorts of things planned. I will be getting a little bit more controlling of other people as well, all in order to reduce my anxiety, my worries. Now, our kids do this as well. The more anxious they get, the more controlling they get. So the more worried they'll be about when am I going to see dad next? Why is mum so cross? What's happening to my family? They are going to become more controlling as a way to manage their anxiety. But of course, the more controlling and bossy they become, the more annoyed you get as a parent with them and the further you move away from them. So it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle. So keep an eye out on any controlling behaviour that you see and try and understand what it means for your child. Is it because they're anxious about something? And in which case, can I help them manage that anxiety in a different way? And you know what, it's for three to five year olds, but it's for 30, 50 year olds as well. All of us, we start controlling things more, the more anxious we get. So worth remembering that. Now, six to 10 year olds. Developmentally, this is considered to be sort of the quiet period of development. They've done all that rapid growing in those first five years. They're not quite adolescents yet, so there's just somewhere in the middle. Um, but it's still a very interesting time of development. So what we know is around the age of seven, ish children enter a sort of an ability to be more ordered and logical in their thinking and maybe this is why education starts at the age of seven in many countries around the world their play is still very important to them but they they've moved from the pretend play the role playing of three to five year olds where they pretend to be all sorts of things to more rule-based play. So the big play becomes very complicated and it's all about rules and regulations but their play is also about showing off I'll show you my skills. And they do this because at this stage now, it's becoming more and more important to be accepted by peers. So by having the biggest Pokemon card collection, the this big, being the fastest Rubik's Cube figure out, or all these sorts of things, these are going to be important for kids to be able to show off their skills and be accepted and loved. But what is important here as well, this is a time where magical thinking can become quite prominent. We all engage in magical thinking sometimes, but it's particularly so at this age group where pretty much anything goes, you know, whether it's monsters or beasts or fantasy stuff, all this sort of things can, can happen. But also magical thinking kicks in when it comes to real life as well. So children at this age will be very, very quick to assume that it's all about them, that it's their fault, that it's because they didn't tidy up their room last week and that's why mum's left and isn't coming back or it's because they didn't get um, a really good grade in maths and that's why dad doesn't want to live them anymore. So they'll start putting two and two together to make five. So what we need to do is help children at this age to understand that they are important, but they're not the reason why these things are happening. So how does a six to 10 year old experience divorce? Well, they're definitely more aware of things and they're more aware of the subtleties. So the hissing arguments downstairs while they're in bed, you may think that's fine. They're, they're not aware of that. They may well be aware of that because they're getting very, very good at the subtleties of relationships and picking up on feelings and senses and tones. They may become more controlling. So we had a look at the three to five year olds and actually six to 10 year olds, they're getting a bit cleverer, a bit more sussy with social stuff and relationships. So they may be starting to very subtly be more controlling in relationships and manipulate the situations. This does not mean they're a bad kid, they're a bad person or anything like that. It means they are trying to figure out ways of coping with a situation which is very, very difficult because it's full of uncertainty. So, at this age, boys and girls may start to respond a little bit differently to things. Boys may show their anger and frustration and annoyance kind of in more physical reactions. Girls may do it through more social control. So you may get reports from school of um, a little bit of bullying, maybe, or being a bit mean to others at school, or just being a little bit more physical at school. Then at this age, of course, screen time is probably starting to kick in a little bit more. It's very, very easy for our kids at this age to disappear into the rabbit hole of devices. I mean, it's easy, isn't it? Stick them in front of a computer game and they're quiet for three hours. Let them play and have a look at stuff online. Another couple of hours of nice, easy, quiet time for you while you can get on with a thousand things that you've got to do. 
and this is okay to a degree but we've got to make sure we are also spending an awful lot of time connecting with our kids at this age talking to them doing activities with them there's also a very important point here which is about delayed reactions so again kids at this age can look as if they're getting on with it no they're not bothered they're fine but what research shows is actually can have a delayed effect so when they hit adolescence that's when it starts coming out so just make sure even if it looks like they're getting on with it and they're doing fine that you still give them loads of support loads of opportunities to ask questions loads of ways of beginning to deal with all sorts of feelings because it just reduces then the chance that it's going to pop out to bite you um, when they become adolescents now talking about adolescence I have a question for you what age do you think adolescence finishes put another way what age do you think we become adults what age do we stop being children so I have something to reveal to you which is that adolescence uh, goes on till about the age of 25 24 or 25 wonderful wonderful neuropsychologists have discovered that it's only at the age of 24 or 25 do people have adult brains i.e fully formed as fully formed they're going to be brains so it's not 18 our children don't suddenly wake up at the age of 18 and become adults it takes a lot lot longer for them to get to the point where they may be starting to see the world in the same way that we do as adults with the same equipment now, 11 to 25 year olds, I've called it toddlerhood too, because this phase of adolescence is very similar to the phase of toddlerhood development that we see between the ages of two and four-ish. Rapid growth, they're physically changing beyond anything, but there's also massive psychological changes as well, which is why they have to sleep an awful lot, just like our toddlers had to. So we're aware of the physical changes that adolescence brings with it, but the psychological changes are something that we're probably a little bit less aware of. So these wonderful neuropsychologists liken it almost to being in a Ferrari without brakes. We've got these super brains that are charging and going really quickly in so many ways. They want to take risks. They just want to do things. They, they rationalize in a very emotional way. But the bit of the brain which is the one that goes, mm, is that such a good idea? Oh, how is that going to impact me in the future? It's gone offline a little bit. So you end up moving around in this Ferrari, racing around in this Ferrari with no brakes. It's a tricky time. It's a really tricky time. But it's also a wonderful time in many ways. And one of the wonderfulnesses is the fact that adolescence is a time where children take the journey from absolute dependence on the family to independence from the family. Because we want our kids to be out there in the world, being adults, being independent, being able to have their own life. And they do this very gradually and it starts off in adolescence. So that's why peers and friends become so, so important to adolescents because they're having to transfer all of their dependence from family to a dependence on their other tribe, their friendships and their relationships. So friends become very important, but that doesn't mean that we as parents become unimportant we are still very very crucial and important to our child our teenagers well-being and we can show that and do that by our time and our availability our closeness our proximity and our willingness to communicate with them so there's some lovely lovely studies that show that have looked at teenagers well-being and things like having family meals is so linked to a teenager feeling okay and even if that teenager spends the whole family meal just grunting and giving monosyllabic answers to questions, you sitting down with them as a parent and having a meal is showing to them, you are important to me. You are still really, really important to me and I still really want to spend time with you. And similarly, there was another study that looked at um, teenage girls and the teenage girls who had the highest self-esteem were those who spent time with their dads, who did things with their dads. And again, it's that sense of, I am still important to my parents even though, you know, I want to be with my friends and I spend most of my time up in my room and I'm a bit rude to them and I don't want to do what they say, they are still very important to me and I'm very important to them. So really, really important that we still remember our adolescents need us. Um, but we do know, because of all those developmental changes that we've seen, that it is a time of, I don't know, psychological distress. Mental health issues go up in adolescence. Um, we know that teenagers have 
more tricky times at school um, and just generally feel a bit more rubbish and that's all part of this developmental stage. We also know that thinking can change for adolescents, they can become very egocentric um, and they enter this sort of all or nothing thinking. So if something is either brilliant or awful or someone's even either wonderful or horrible. There's no sort of middle ground for them. It's not a kind of place that they spend much time. So one of our jobs as parents is to help them see there is a middle ground here um, and it's an OK place to be. But adolescence, as I say, it can be full of positives as well. You know, they're very passionate about things. They take on causes. Um, they're active in creating change for the better. So there's lots of things that um, are good about adolescence, but it is a challenging time for the adolescent and the parent. And what does it mean if their parents separate or divorce at this time? Um, well, it can mean an awful lot. And just because your teenager might not spend that much time at home at the moment, that doesn't mean they're not affected by what happens at home. They are still very, very affected by what happens at home. Um, I've spoken to a lot of young people whose um, parents divorced when they started uni. So the parents waited until their child started uni at the age of 18 or 19, and then they got separated. Now, I've spoken to a lot of parents who said, well, we did this because we didn't want to upset them when they were still living at home. We wanted them to move away and then we thought we'd separate because it'd have less of an impact on them. This is not the case. Young people don't leave home when they start university. They are starting to emotionally and physically detach from home when they go to university. It's a long, long process. It will take many, many years. So home is still home for them and their family is still family. And if their parents split up at that point, it still has an impact. And the teams that I've spoken to said, you know, when my parents told me once I started uni that they're separating, it made me think that all of my childhood has been fake, that it was somehow this kind of lie. I thought it was, I had a happy family and all these holidays and we were having a lovely time together. But all the time it turns out mum and dad couldn't wait to separate and they were just waiting for me to go to uni or move out from my gap year for them to separate. So don't underestimate the impact your separation or divorce will have on teenagers, 18, 19, 20, 23 year olds. It will still have an impact on them. And one of the ways that it can have an impact on them is, of course, they're, they're at the stage where they're developing their own romantic relationships. They may have their first boyfriend or girlfriend or they may be moving in with a partner or they may even be getting engaged or getting married. Unlikely, but, you know, at this stage they might do. And if their parents split up at this point, it will help. It will get in the way of them understanding and trusting themselves and other people. So it can still have an impact on them. We know that adolescents in general, as we've seen, Ferrari without brakes, risky behaviour is something that they do anyway. If they're presented with a separation or a divorce, which turns their whole life upside down, then as a way of coping with that, they could engage in more risky behaviour. Drug taking, drinking, promiscuity... Uh, truanting from school, whatever it is. So that might be one of the things that they do as a reaction. We know that teenagers question authority, that's, that's their job, um, but um, it could do more of that. They will start saying to you, well, you can't tell me what to do because you've you left us or um, you clearly can't sort out your relationship, so how come you're telling me what to do with mine? So you may get a lot of this. And again, this is about feeling out of control. It is fueled by anxiety. And they're trying to control the situation themselves because they've lost trust in the adults around them to control the situation. It may also mean, depending on their age and depending on the situation, that they take on carer roles, that they become the one that has to look after mum or look after dad. Or if they're older teenagers, they may be the ones that has to keep, you know, guys, should we get together for mum's birthday? Or um, what about Christmas? Where are we going to go for that? So they're trying to sort out all these family traditions and um, rituals. So... It does, separation divorce has a major impact on these kids as well, even up to the age 25 and beyond. That doesn't mean it's a necessarily a bad thing, but it's just for you as parents to understand that, that the children still need you at this age. So we have done a whistle-stop tour of child development. It's like a, a module on an undergraduate course, isn't it? Why is it important? Well, it is so important because hopefully now you can see that each one of your children will need different things from you um, because of their ages and the stage of development they're at. You might have a two-year-old and a seven-year-old. They're going to need different things from you. Your teenagers are going to need something different from you than your ten-year-old. 
So it's just being aware of that and being curious and being able to find out what is going on for them. How are you seeing the world? Use your theory of mind to put yourself in their shoes. What does it feel like to be like a six-year-old going through this? There's loads of wonderful books around child development that you can pick up tips and stuff from. But know that children are not just mini adults. They're not like us, just a little bit smaller. They're not. They have completely different brains. They have completely different ways of seeing the world, understanding the world and coping with the world. So I really hope that this little whistle stop tour of child development helps you to understand that and helps you to see that divorce is not an event. It's a process for your child. And every time your child moves to a different stage of development, they may need to review the divorce and the separation. So when they're 10, even if you'd separated from your partner when they were when they were two years old, they might still want to go back to it and ask questions and find out more. Why? How come? So be open to those questions. I hope you enjoyed that. It's lovely to talk to you about child development, one of my favourite topics ever. And it's very, very big thanks to our sponsors for making this project possible. So I will see you in session two. Goodbye. <laughs>